Pessoal, boa tarde. É, Bem-vindos de volta ao nosso webinar. A gente passou 15 dias sem realizar webinars e a ideia a partir de agora é essa, já que a gente está voltando a, aos trabalhos no laboratório, as aulas da graduação também estão voltando. É, e nesse primeiro webinar após esses 15 dias, a gente convidou a, prof, a professora Marina Leite. A professora Marina Leite ela é professora da, do Departamento de Ciência de Materiais, Ciência e Engenharia de Materiais, da Universidade da Califórnia, em Davis. E ela passa, passa a graduação em Química, aqui pela Universidade Federal de Pernambuco, e mestrado e doutorado em Física pela Universidade Estadual de Campinas, São Paulo. É, a professora Marina já ministrou mais de 100 é, é, palestras, convidadas em conferências, instituições de todo mundo, isso deve, deve ser bem mais agora, acho que isso é um número do, do ano passado. É, foi participante convidada do Simpósio de, é, de Fronteiras de Engenharia, em 2017, da Academia Nacional de Engenharia, é, também em 2017, premiada em 2016 com APS é, Opsync, eu acho, eu acho que é isso o nome, Sustainable Energy Fellowship, da Sociedade Americana de Física. É, trabalhou é, na Universidade de Maryland, entre 2013 e 2019. Trabalhou antes disso no, no NIST, é, no laboratório, trabalhando em metrologia e nanoescala, na área de materiais para energia. E fez um pós-doutorado no Instituto de Tecnologia da Califórnia, é, nos Estados Unidos. Então, professora, muito obrigado por ter é, aceitado o nosso convite de ministrar esse webinar. É, só um aviso, o webinar será ministrado em inglês, mas as perguntas poderão ser feitas em português, tá? E é, o link para o certificado de participação vai estar disponível 20 minutos antes de terminar o webinar, é, na descrição do, do vídeo, assim como o formulário para é, frequência do pessoal de, do, do programa de pós-graduação em ciência de materiais. Também vai estar na descrição do vídeo, 20 minutos antes é, de finalizar o webinar. Né? Obrigado, professora, mais uma vez. É. Obrigada, Manuel. Eu mudo para o modo apresentação agora? É, isso. Manuel, mudo para o modo apresentação? Sim, pode mudar para o modo apresentação. Ok. Tá, ah, Joia. Ok, obrigada. Muito obrigada pela apresentação. Obrigada, Manuel e Jéssica, por ajudar aqui com a, 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 os efeitos técnicos. E obrigada, Briana, por ter entrado em contato comigo. É um prazer estar aqui falando com, com o pessoal da UFPE. Eu queria pedir desculpas, porque eu vou ter que apresentar o seminário em inglês. A razão é porque com a pandemia, todo mundo aqui tem filhos, e os filhos não podem ir para a creche, tem que trabalhar, estão com tempo extremamente limitado. Obrigada por compreender aí a minha, a minha falta de, de, de tempo extra nesse momento, mas eu vou tentar falar bem devagar e as perguntas decididamente podem ser feitas em português. Por favor, perguntem um, durante o seminário, inclusive. Eu não espero que esse seminário demore uma hora e meia, a gente nunca dá seminários que duram mais do que uma hora aqui. Então, uh, uh, vamos uh, começar. É, então, hoje eu queria falar com vocês sobre uh, materiais para fotônica e para ótica, para componentes óticos, além dos uh, metais nobres que a gente está acostumado a ver em aplicações. Então, como o Manuel disse, eu estou no Departamento de uh, Ciência e Engenharia de Materiais da Universidade da Califórnia, em Davis. Onde é que a gente fica? Bom, a gente fica nesse pontinho vermelho aqui do Google Maps, a, a 20 minutos de Sacramento, a uma hora e meia de São Francisco, a região é, é extremamente rica do ponto de vista científico e tecnológico, a gente tem... Berkeley bem perto da gente, tem o Synchrotron da Stanford, o SLAC, tem o LBL, que é o Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, que tem uma infraestrutura fantástica, e tem o Sandia National Lab, que é do Departamento de Defesa americano. Além de ciência e tecnologia, a área também é muito privilegiada do ponto de vista de, de balanceamento entre vida pessoal e trabalho. Se você é interessado em, em comer bem, eu diria que Sonoma e Napa é uma região uh, onde tem várias vinícolas e a gastronomia é muito interessante. Se você gosta de, um, alp, é, de esquiar, você pode ir para Yosemite, caminhar também, hiking. São Francisco, como eu disse, fica uma hora e meia de relógio, uma cidade muito legal. Tem o Lake Tahoe, que é um lugar onde o pessoal daqui vai bastante. Isso aqui é uma das 
as rodovias mais famosas, The One, a rodovia 1, que realmente é, vai margeando o Pacífico durante uma boa parte. Então, a vida marinha é extremamente rica nessa região também. Mas, uh, então, sendo um pouco mais específico com relação a UC Davis, é uma universidade que tem quase 40 mil estudantes, nós temos um número enorme de bicicletas, 22 mil bicicletas, apesar da cidade ter 60 mil habitantes, só dentro da universidade tem mais de 20 mil bicicletas, então é bem eco-friendly, é uma bolha bem liberal uh, nesse aspecto dentro dos Estados Unidos. Uh, muito ativo do ponto de vista de pesquisa, como você pode ver aqui, a gente tem um, mais de 100 cursos de graduação e mais de 100 cursos de pós-graduação, especificamente o Departamento de Ciência e Engenharia de Materiais é, é razoavelmente pequeno, como sempre, tem uh, 14 professores, uh, desses um terço são a uh, mulher, o que é um número uh, impressionante nos Estados Unidos, uh, nós ranqueamos mais ou menos entre uns 30 uh, dentro dos Estados Unidos, se esse é um número de interesse para alguns de vocês. Em termos de tamanho, nós temos uh, aproximadamente 150 estudantes de graduação e 80 de doutorado. E a razão pela qual eu estou fazendo essa propaganda é porque se você tiver interesse em fazer um intercâmbio aqui, quando essa pandemia terminar, ou um pós-doc, por favor, entre em contato comigo. É muito trabalho, é muito divertido. Eu diria que é os dois ao mesmo tempo, sempre. Então, um, now I will switch to English. I apologize for that. And I'll try to speak uh, slowly. So, as I mentioned to you, today I would like to share our recent results in optical materials for photonics and the work that we've been doing, um, developing materials in which we can uh, control the optical properties. So, I, because we're in engineering, I personally like to make an analogy with the steel. Aço, certo? The steel is a, an alloy that really revolutionized the way we live today. So, in the 13th century, before uh, uh, Christ, right, uh, before there were material science, uh, early blacksmith, they discovered that iron would become harder and stronger if we would leave them in charcoal furnaces. So they realized that there's something happening, right? Some type of chemical reaction here that is making this material different. So if we skip apologies here for the, the history of fictionados for the, the, the lack of a, a proper um, time scale, but it's just a qualitative example. Uh, if we skip a few centuries, right, and we go now to the Roman era, what we do see is that then uh, as a society, we learn that we could uh, now make use of this material that was harder and uh, stronger. So that's uh, an example here, how we could use steel to dress for combat, and then uh, eventually realize, okay, this is very useful, however, it's not well manufactured, right? So that's when in the third century AD, we start doing mass production, and I think a Chinese craftsman here developed a, a key role in uh, making large scale, right, uh, steel. Then we realized that, hold on, we can uh, refine uh, the functionality, right? We can uh, make use of a uh, millimeter structures, microstructures, and uh, now we're talking about a metal metallurgy and how we can make use again of steel for something completely different. Then I would say it was definitely a driver for the industrial revolution. Of course, without steel, I don't think it would have been where we are right now. And now it's used everywhere, right? Uh, from a, a, a surgical tools all the way to, to buildings, you know, not only from the structural point of view, but also for design sake. Basically, if you look around yourself, I'm sure you can find a piece of steel, whatever you're sitting or standing. Almost anywhere you're going to find that unless you're, you know, in a remote location. So the whole point here, the reason why I like making this analogy, it's because alloying the mixing of uh, the elements enabled us to develop a material with a superior mechanical performance. In this case, a material that has a very high tensile strength, and at the same time, there is low cost. Therefore, we have it everywhere. Now, in analogy to that, uh, going back to the whole point of the seminar series, right, which is a, a part of the SPI NOSA student chapter in Recife, can we, by alloying, develop optical materials that are going to have superior properties, or at least in which we can uh, control the properties on demand? When I'm talking about optical properties, I'm generally referring to basically can we control the electromagnetic spectrum specifically transmission reflection and absorption of light that would be very impactful and uh, um, another way of looking at it is uh, can we control the permittivity or if you prefer the refractive index right related to the permittivity of a material so basically the big picture is that right now the permittivity of a, of a metals is very constrained by the metal itself right so there are a few things that we can do to change a little bit the optical response, and I'll tell a little bit more about that soon. But essentially, if you look at here, 
at epsilon one and epsilon two, both the real and imaginary parts of the permittivity for aluminum, gold, silver, and copper, what we can see is that they have a well-defined behavior, right? Now, it turns out that as a consequence of that, there are just so many applications that uh, we can, uh, um, for which we can use these metals for. And there's going to be some limitation, right? Uh, so, so, for example, we know that if we have a high epsilon 2, there's probably a lot of light absorption. So, we'd like to be in some scenarios in a situation where we want a material and a device that will absorb very little light or it's going to absorb a whole lot of light. And I'll show you examples of that. So, it would be great if we could control the optical behavior. Not only that, but also we're looking to materials that can be CMOS compatible. So we know very well that gold and silver are not CMOS compatible. They're also noble metals, right, by definition, so they are very costly. So if you could look into materials such as aluminum or magnesium, every pavement has magnesium, right? So that it's incredibly cheap. So that would be a very interesting pathway for new optical materials. Now, um, one uh, comment that I want to make here, because I'm assuming there are quite a few students that are undergrads in physics, is that there is a field um, in applied physics and the material science that is called plasmonics, which is basically um, investigating light material interactions in metals and specifically. And basically what happens here is that when we have an interface between a metal and a dielectric, if you shine light, you're going to, um, if you do it the right way, you're actually going to uh, be able to promote a collective oscillation of electrons at this interface. And that's basically what this cross-section schematic is representing. And if we do that, we can then excite surface plasma polaritons. Now, this is what happens when we have a thin film uh, metal dielectric interface. If we now look into nanostructures, and I'm not going to say a whole lot about nanostructures um, beyond, the, you know, in terms of introduction, I don't think there's a need at this point. But if you now look at a metallic nanostructure, say silver, for example, what we do see in this graph where we can see a time here as a function of electric field is that um, this uh, um, oscillation of uh, uh, this, uh, this charge is basically going to be confined to a sub-wavelength dimension. And that will give rise to what we call a localized surface plasma resonance, or LSPR. Now, this will lead to an electric field enhancement that can be orders of magnitude. And that can be super useful, right? If what you want, if you think about it, that you could, we could make use of this enhancement and use light to store information instead of electrons, right? So there you go, photonics instead of electronics. Now, these uh, surface plasmons and, and uh, the localized uh, uh, surface plasmon resonance, they can be controlled, tuned to a certain extent by um, varying the size of the nanostructure, the geometry, the medium surrounding the nanostructure, and uh, its chemical composition. Turns out that until very recently, the, the role of chemical composition and how we could use that as an additional knob to control the surface plasmas is something that has been overlooked in the scientific community. So motivated by that, and to solve the constraint, uh, right, uh, that uh, permittivity is a predefined uh, in, a, in a single metals, we decided to look into um, coin age metals to start this work. And um, our goal here in the beginning was let's develop a library of the optical behavior of these binary mixtures. So we started doing this work in 2006. And uh, what you're seeing here in the slides is just a, a, an illustration of how coin age metals were um, the, the, sta the starting point. So here you can see copper, silver, and gold. And the reasons of why we chose these three metals were the following. One. There has been already extensive work in the literature on plasmonics using silver and gold. So these are materials that are very well understood. Second of all, these three metals, they have a, a very similar bend structure. They belong to the same column in the periodic table. So you can see my background in chemistry here coming to play. Uh, third of all, silver and gold have um, very similar lattice constant. And a, a fourth reason for that, um, these metals, uh, um, well, they mix. Not uh, all of the options mix, but looking at the phase diagram can be really interesting. In the case of a gold and silver, for instance, they do alloy, meaning we have a, a, a negative enthalpy of formation across the entire chemical composition range. For gold and copper, it's not so trivial. We do have a, some uh, uh, chemical compositions that are, will form into a mixture and alloy, and for others, that will not be the case. You know, for copper, silver, that's a way more complicated. Um, we can form an intermetallic. Uh, a lot of times, you will not be 
uh, a complete alloy material can segregate, and this has a lot to do with thermodynamics and mixing entropy, which is another interesting topic. So um, let's go back here to the first uh, um, goal. As I mentioned to you, it was for us to develop a library of the optical response. Now, it turns out that the optical response of these materials is far away from being the linear combination of the two elements weighted by chemical composition. I don't have any examples in my slides here, but as backup slides I do, I'm happy to share if someone wants to see a concrete example of that. So the first thing we did was to fabricate the thin films um, with a very narrow and well-controlled gradient in chemical composition. So that's what you're seeing here, that by sputtering, later I have a video on sputtering, but for now, I have to believe me that I have this spray of atoms from two sources, two metallic sources, and that by co-depositing without rotating the substrate, we could obtain a films that were from pure silver, for example, all the way to pure gold, and the same for gold, a copper, and a copper silver, as you can see here in the slides. And I note that this in these photographs, these glass slides, they are four inch by six inch. So one inch is a 2.54 centimeters centimeters yeah so that's the conversion okay so they're pretty large that's what i'm telling you so once we we checked the chemical composition gradient in the samples uh, what we did well the first thing you do if you're working with optical materials is a uh, light transmission measurements okay in this case in the visible range because that's what we're interested at and what we see here uh, on the left the measurements for silver gold and a calculations um for uh, the same uh, binary mixture what you can see is that a one from pure gold to pure silver, we shifted the, the peak in transmission, very expected due to the, the, the surface plasmas here, propagation. We have, a, some, uh, con we have a contribution of both metals here, right? Even once we had a tiny bit of silver, we already have the contribution, this shoulder as I'm pointing here, I'm assuming you can see my mouse. And then I think it's got a little different, um, around a 50-50% of each metal, that basically we have a one abroad a peak, and eventually we essentially have only silver contribution as we should. Our measurements were in very good agreement with our calculations. A lot of data, but just to give you an idea here, um, we did definitely have a similar very good agreement for the other two uh, binary mixtures. And the point here that I want to make is that, again, when you look at the optical response of these films, it was very far from the simple linear combination of the two pure metals. So what the trigger does was the following. Hold on, if eventually, right, we want to design photonic devices and make use of these metallic mixtures and uh, uh, make sure, right, we can control light emission, um, absorption and transmission, um, what we need to do is to make sure we have a really good understanding, right, of uh, the permittivity or the refractive index. So we had to essentially measure that. So what we do to measure permittivity, we combine transmission measurements with reflection measurements and we use ellipsometry for that. And basically what we did was to essentially measure and model. It's not a measurement only. Once you measure, once you do an ellipsometry measurement, you have to model as well. In this case, we're using B-spline as our mathematical function. We make sure chromoscronic relations are enforced at all times. Otherwise, it would be a physically impossible result. And here what I'm showing to you is a, a epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 as a function of wavelength. And it's color-coded, right? So what we can see is that uh, very uh, um, striking here is the fact that um, for epsilon 2, for instance, you know, we do have here for 50-50% of gold silver a quite different uh, um, response than compared to the other metals, metal, metallic mixtures that are more in the, the red, the yellowish color here that are silver rich, okay? Now, for the other, there are a lot of discussion that go into these graphs. I'm not going to talk to you into a lot of details, but basically we could see some signature of interband transitions here. There's a lot of solid state physics that go into the analysis of this permittivity, but Overall, the message that I want you to bring home is the fact that um, it's not linear. In, in fact, it can get even more messier if we add uh, even more metals to, to these mixtures. Okay, but the idea here also is that, for example, for epsilon 2, if you look back here where I'm pointing with the mouse, this green data, 50% silver, 50% gold, turns out that this sample presented a lower epsilon 2 than a pure silver in red or pure gold in blue. So this is very useful, and at the time, I'm really interested in this type of behavior, especially in applications where we want a very little light absorption by the metal. For example, let's say we have a device in which we want a lot of uh, forward light scatter, and that's what happens when you're dealing with solar cells, and I do a lot of work on uh, electronic materials as well for solar cells in my group. So at the time, back in 2016, we were really looking for a recipe so that we could 
increase the amount of light that gets into the cell. And that's something that it could do by decorating some solar cells with metallic structures that would then uh, promote a lot of forward scattering if you have the right refractive index contrast between the two materials, which is a story for another day, maybe another seminar. So um, basically, in order to corroborate these measurements, um, what we did was a very simple experiment. And I love this experiment because it's an experiment that undergraduates can do. Sorry, the sun is uh, getting close here, so I'm going to move in my yard. But um, what we can do is an experiment, as I was saying, that I really like because it's, uh, undergrads can do that. In fact, I implemented these experiments in a lab class that I teach. So literally what we need is a thin film, a thin metallic film deposited in a glass substrate and a prism with a well-known refractive index. And uh, what we're measuring here is basically the surface plasma polarity and propagation. And I think this is really neat. Um, so essentially, we come in with light. You can choose whatever wavelength you want. And you, you better know well the thickness of the film. That's really critical so that then we can have a, this a turning uh, reflection condition here and we can then excite the surface plasma uh, polarity on here, the surface thin film dielectric here air. So essentially what we, this experiment is what we call the Kretschmann configuration. So you can see here how we can determine epsilon 1, okay, not the, the whole permittivity, but the real part of the permittivity, epsilon 1, as a function of the, the permittivity of air, which we know very well, the, the angle here, right, of our surface plasma uh, propagation and, the, and the, um, the refractive index here of our material. So that becomes uh, um, a very uh, straightforward in reality. And what you can see here at this, in these examples in the bottom graphs where I'm showing to you silver, gold, and copper is essentially the reflected power as a function of internal angle. So as we rotate the angle, this external angle here, you can actually capture an angle that is going to show very, very low reflection. And the reason why I get a very low reflect reflection in our detector is because at this particular critical angle here, we are then exciting our plasmas. Okay? So you can see that uh, um, the full width half max of this peak it can vary quite a bit. So for silver, it's particularly very narrow which basically explains why people love using silver in plasmonics despite the oxidation of the material. Gold is also very deep. The reason why people don't use gold as much is because it's a material that is considered very lossy in the visible range of the spectrum. When people say lossy, they're referring to gold absorb quite a bit of light in the visible range. So it's better for IR type of applications in IR, not the visible range. And copper, which is quite broad, also a bit lossy and not as well behaved material. Also, I'm not mentioning that, but you can imagine that uh, how compact the grains are in this thin film deposition, how small they are, can influence a lot the optical behavior. That's a whole other field, uh, you know, of research if you want. So now um, I'm showing to you here all of our SPP measurements using the Kretschmann configuration for the binary mixtures. Again, on the left, you're seeing the measurement, and on the right, you're seeing the calculations. You see a very good agreement between the two. So we could basically see how much shift is there. And then what we did, at least for one wavelength, was to um, determine epsilon 1 and compare our measurements with our completely independent ellipsometry measurements. And then we found a really good agreement. So essentially here you're seeing epsilon 1 at a one particular wavelength, 637, as a function of chemical composition for each one of the samples. And then at the square, the solid square is the ellipsometry measurements, meaning transmission and reflection combined. And the, the, the SPP is in Kretschmann configuration there is a very nonlinear combination behavior, right, of the two as a function of chemical composition. For, silver, for um, copper and silver, it's almost a linear, but in this case, we do have a, um, a, a material that is not a fully alloyed. There's a lot of segregation in the material. Um, also, something else I would like to mention is that, so what causes that, right? We're very interested in completely understanding what is the origin. So, to, to really dig into the origin, this is still a work in progress. We then team up with uh, Alexandre Rocha, who is at uh, EFT in uh, Sao Paulo, in Brazil, Instituto de Física Teórica, who is an expert in a DFT, density functional theory. And basically what Alexandre did was to calculate the bin structure of these uh, binary mixtures. And this was really interesting at the time uh, because when I met him at a conference in Brazil, I told him, Alexandre, we, we have a problem that you can help us solve. We want to know how the bin structure is changing, and uh, we would love to know what is the contribution of each one of the atoms. And he was like, well, is it going to be the same? I'm like, I bet not. So let's uh, double check. So here, I love this example because 
this is one of those moments where experimentalists and computational physicists can work together and it's much better for the field, right? So we do a lot of work combining. And you see later on some more simulations from my group. So here what you're seeing is a band structure of silver, very textbook. If you, if you use a Kitel or Ashcroft in your classes, that's exactly the same thing here what you're seeing, the band structure for FCC silver, same thing for gold here in black. But it was really cool in the work and the calculations that uh, uh, Alexandre did was the fact that we could then now resolve the contribution of each one of the elements. So, so what you're seeing here now is that, for instance, once we add a little bit of gold, 25% uh, gold only, for instance, it completely dominates the band structure, right? And another thing that we could uh, uh, realize, uh, thanks to the DFT, is the fact that there was a threshold for an interband transition. So we're very interested in the gamma pointer here. So if you think of back in your, in your solid state classes, right, the distance here between these two. So we're very interested in seeing how much uh, um, these interband transitions shift uh, for longer wavelength with increasing of gold content. So basically what I'm telling you is that this gap here decreases with the increase of gold content. And that's essentially what I'm telling you. Now, we also uh, moved on to look into other type of metals, so in, in for other types of applications. So in this case, this is a collaboration with the, the Army Research Lab, the Josh McClure, and the Gana Alexandre at a EFT Brazil, where we're looking to palladium gold for catalysis, specifically for uh, low temperature ethanol oxidation. So again, you can see here the DFT was very handy for us. In this case, uh, I find it really neat that uh, you have pure gold, and now we're looking again at the gamma point. Once we add a tiny bit of a palladium, you can see how you change completely the valence band here of the material. So this is a, a, a really interesting in this particular case to see the break in degeneracy of, of these bands. And uh, just one example of overall result here is, I mean, look at the binding energy as a function of chemical composition. What we could see is that uh, there is a combination of palladium gold, you know, that does much better for us in terms of the onset potential. We want the lowest onset potential so that we can... Uh, 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 nail this a chemical reaction here of hydrogen production. So, so I'm at, sorry, at an oxidation, hydrogen production, not a project. So I'm going to actually have to walk up all of this for that because my battery is running low. So just give me a second, please. Okay. So moving on and now, uh, apologies for that. <laughs> so uh, I was just dragging my, my, my battery away faster than what I thought. So, um, moving on now, we're very interested not only looking at um, metallic thin films, but eventually and essentially nanostructures. And the reason for that is because, as I was saying at the beginning of my talk, we really want to be able to design optical devices and optical components. And uh, um, thin films are great. They're a great model system, very easy to fabricate and to scale up. But we're really interested also in, a, in a nano, nanostructures and specifically in investigating also light material interactions that take place at the nanoscale. So um, we are, um, in terms of applications, we've been doing some work where we really want to try to use these metallic nanostructures to control electrocatalysis and photocatalysis type of reactions. So this is more of a chemical engineering type of application that is really neat, in my opinion, even though I'm not at all an expert in catalysis, so we team up with people for that. And as I mentioned, you know, we want to see how light interact with these uh, nanostructures that are now different than a pure silver or pure gold. they actually a combination, even a combination of other metals, right? At, from the near field to the far field, how is this going to change? So note that um, developing this library of the permittivity is really critical, um, especially because one, now we can think about inverse design of nanostructures, right? For example, suppose one of your folks tell me, I want a material that is going to have a very low transmission at a certain wavelength range. So I can then tell you this should be the chemical composition that you're looking for. So that's our ultimate goal now. And you can imagine that using machine learning, if you do a little bit of a forward looking here, right, for that, and you're looking at the polyelemental alloys, not only two elements, but five, eight, that would be a really interesting pathway to take. So um, going back here again, I was saying, okay, we want to look into nanostructures and how they can, uh, how we can tailor right, the, the optical response once uh, we have them. So let me show to you a video here. There is one method, simple and easy to scale up to make these nanostructures. And I'll show you samples that were fabricated by an undergraduate student that now is doing his PhD and is extremely well, Garrett. So we basically have the co-sputtering the position of two metals. We rotate the substrate. And then after that, what we do is uh, an annealing treatment at very well controlled temperature and very well controlled environment. 
then what happens is that depending on the metals that we have, depending on the substrate, in this case, in this case glass, depending on the temperature of the annealing and the time, we can promote what we call surface uh, de-wetting. So de-wetting uh, wetting from a uh, molhar, right? So what is going to happen is that it, to minimize Gibbs free energy, instead of having a thinner film, uh, um, the ultimate result is going to be a lump of a nanostructure. So, you know, some clusters. They are not epitaxial, they are not perfect crystals, they are polycrystals. However, um, they still hold the most of uh, uh, the desired properties for our application. So basically, that's what you're seeing here. And ultimately, again, we want to see how light is interacting with these materials from the far to the near field again. So um, when we do, oops, sorry, it played the video again. I'm not sure why. OK, so this is an example of uh, an SEM, a scanning electron microscopy image of how uh, uh, one of those samples look like. In this case, a mix of 50% silver and 50% gold. So you can see that the method is not perfect. I like showing a zoom out on purpose. We did extensive statistics on that. You can see that sometimes there is some uh, incomplete uh, um, coalescence process going on, like in this particular case. But what I like about this method is that one, after doing a lot of statistics, we do get you know, a fairly narrow spatial distribution of the particles too they were far away from each other uh, in this case so that we would not have a coupling effects between one particle and the other so it was good for us to see how much can we control the near field optical behavior um third of all it's very easy to scale up now there are other methods right if you want to make an array of nanostructures very well ordered you could use a electron beam lithography you could use a templated deposition right make little templates with whatever shape you want and then an e-beam right whatever you want. So there are definitely other methods, right, that can be used. But this is sufficient for um, our uh, interest right now. So then, um, and this was several years ago, 2017. So um, basically, if you look at a very representative nanoparticle, such as this one, I really like this image because you can even see the footprint of uh, 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 the film, right, of where the particles are and how the coalescence process takes place. This is really interesting. It's literally the footprint. It's not coincidence. So anyway, if you look at uh, into a representative nanoparticle and we now map the chemical composition, in case you're wondering, hold on, do we really have a mixture or is it a core shell type of structure? So then we do um, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy. EDS or EDX, people call it both ways. And essentially what we do is that we, we mill the sample, so we use the focus ion beam so that we can remove layers, right? It's a tomographic technique in that sense, although destructive, right? We can essentially be removing the layers of the, the nanoparticle and be mapping the chemical composition as we go. So that's essentially what you're seeing C. It's a map of the chemical composition distribution where we do see silver and gold uniformly distributed. And that happens for the entire particle, okay, after sectioning multiple, multiple times. So we do have an alloy check. And now, since I mentioned to you, let me just give you one example, since I mentioned to you that we're interested in the near field optical properties. So let me just show to you one example. In this particular case, um, what we can do besides a regular reflection and a, and a transmission type of measurements is actually look at the transmission in the near field. So now we're talking about evanescent waves. So it's different physics right there, right? And uh, the way we do these measurements is the following. We basically use a, um, a probe, such as an atomic force microscope, microscope of probe. In this case, the probes are hollow. We pass a light, we can select the wavelength, so we pass light through these probes. Then we raster scan the surface of our sample, much um, like a record player. You might be too young to have seen a record player in your life, but that's basically what you're saying. And then what we do, we acquire um, information regarding the morphology of the particles. And simultaneously, we also collect light that has been transmitted in this case. We use an objective lens here underneath that is not represented in this schematic. So basically, we can spatially and spectrally resolve the near field optical response of these nanoparticles. So what you're seeing here is a sequence of uh, morphology images, just showing the topography, how there are no changes that happen. So there is no funny interaction between the probe and the, and the sample. Material is intact. And at the same time, we're acquiring information about how much light is being transmitted. So we can see here that at 500 nanometers, it's all very dark. So not a big deal. Quite a bit of light has been absorbed. 
Eventually, at 600 nanometers, at resonance, now we're talking about that uh, localized surface plasma resonance, okay, of these nanoparticles, you can see that it looks really bright, much brighter than in the other cases. And essentially, we're wondering, okay, we have this little dot, we have all this bright uh, around the right of the particles, so what's going on here? So then we essentially combine these experiments with uh, um, uh, simulations, 3D full field simulations. Uh, this is just a graph showing how the nanoscale behavior is in very good agreement with the macroscopic for transmission measurements, that's all. But anyway, so what we do is that we simulate this uh, 3D scenario. We simulate our metallic nanoparticle, the, the indium thin oxide, the ITO transparent uh, material here in our glass substrate. And then we can, uh, we essentially are solving Maxwell's equations, okay, numerically. And we use a commercial software for that. I can tell more about that if you're interested. But basically, we can add the monitors that is going to tell us how the electric field is decaying. And we can add these monitors wherever we want. We need to make sure we mimic the situation in a very um, realistic way. So in this case, for example, to represent the, the light here near field, we use a dipole for that. And basically what you're seeing is a comparison between the experiments and the simulation for one particle only, um, just due to uh, simulation time, okay? We could definitely have made an array, but you can do periodic boundary and just pretend you're repeating that infinitely. And essentially what we can see here, um, what I like about this uh, simulation is that you can see that at 550, we start observing this quadrupole signature here, these four brighter spots. And then once we add resonance, it really looks a lot brighter. So just be aware that the monitor is actually in the ITO layer, okay? So really at the interface of uh, um, the metallic particles, you know, and around them, we have this bright field and underneath those. And this is really is uh, a characteristic of uh, um, the localized surface plasma resonance and an enhancement in our electric field, right? You can see here in the simulations, our scale is module square of electric field. So that's something that was really neat for us. And then if you want to have a full picture of what's going on, instead of looking at a, a plane and monitor only, you can also look at a cross-section monitor. And that's what we're showing here. Um, how I think it's even more clear. So at 600 nanometers here, when we're at resonance, you can see all these bright uh, spots here around the particles, you know, and also on top of here, really due to the localized surface plasma resonance. So I think that's very helpful, uh, in sp specifically, sorry, specifically here right, those underneath those of the particles. So we do have this field enhancement that we desire so much. And we could do a few things to optimize this field enhancement and the size of the particle, you know, and geometry and all that kind of stuff. So um, let me move on now to a, a slightly different topic. So I wanted to show you one example of what we can do with nanostructures. And there are a lot of others. We've been doing now quite a bit of work on a, um, palladium gold, also in looking to hydrogenation of these metals in a collaboration with electrical engineering. So basically, we, we add the hydrogen into these metallic structures and we take them out, and you can see there's a lot of hysteresis and a lot of interesting effects that can go on. And this can be used to encrypt information, but that's another story. Someone wants to know more about it, I'm happy to share. But let me talk a little bit about other types of materials for the following reason. In all the examples I've shown you so far, silver, gold, um, especially, right? It's a good model system. A gold or copper, a silver or copper, and then a palladium gold. These are all very expensive metals, and we do care, right, ultimately, to can we apply these materials to something. After all, we're in material science and engineering. So um, one work that Mariama Diaz, who um, uh, was a student in a University of São Carlos, I believe, yes, Federal of São Carlos, Federal de São Carlos, and she did a postdoc in my group, and now she's a faculty. She's actually here doing her sabbatical, which is really nice. Uh, basically, she started looking at um, alloys and mixtures of uh, earth-abundant, low-cost metals that are also CMOS compatible. And then the work that Mariama did with the, with the Chen, who was a student in my group at the time, was to essentially look into, can we make an optical device in which we can have a, a high control, in this case, in light absorption? And what are the appropriate metals in a metallic mixtures for that. So essentially, the design of the device is quite simple. Okay, it's a metallic thin film, and that's stacked with a semiconductor material. And then, sorry, the other way around, right? The semiconductor material, uh, uh, the, and, uh, and the metal, of course, at the bottom is a back reflector. So basically, this is a better picture. So basically, we have a semiconductor material, in this case, silicon, very standard, right? And then if we use a, a metal back reflector here, a mirror, if you want, a metallic material, can we trap a light and have light be essentially almost all absorbed within this material? So then 
Um, we started looking into uh, lithography-free methods. So therefore, the thin film configuration still, you can make a super absorber out of an unstructured a type of a system, definitely. And the, what she saw was the following. Um, when we compare usual metals, right, for, for, for plasmonics, photonics, uh, such as silver, gold, uh, chromium is really tricky to make high quality, aluminum, copper, and then the combination of aluminum, copper, what she saw through um, analytical calculations here is that the absorption, light absorption, would it get really high for chromium? So we're very excited about that, but we thought, okay, how can you make high quality chromium? That's a very tricky, not trivial at all. Now, when we look at aluminum and copper, we thought, okay, there's something going on here. It definitely looks high for copper, but the combination of the two gives a much better response. So this is a 99% light absorption and it's a multi-wavelength, meaning we can shift these uh, 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 wavelength of very high absorption by simply uh, changing the thickness here of the silicon layer. Okay, so the silicon layer here is represented by D. It varies between a five nanometers and 75, and uh, the metal just has to be optically thick. Okay, so then basically once we do that, we can uh, uh, select right here in F, this graph I think represents very well, what is the wavelength range in which you want this very high light absorption. So this is really interesting for a lot of applications. Um, and the one thing that I want to call your attention to is that when you can see, what you're seeing here, this is the second row, is the, the thickness of the silicon layer as a function of wavelength. So we can see every single optical mode, right, that is being excited. And again, for aluminum, copper, how those get super, super intense, so how the absorption is nearly 100%. And even more so, if we change the angle of a light incidence here represented by theta, we can see that it's pretty robust up to almost a 70 degrees. So it's almost omnidirectional, which I think is a really neat as well, because a lot of times we suffer a big penalty, right, by doing an angular incidence. Then uh, uh, Chen uh, um, demonstrated this, uh, uh, this super absorber. Uh, here, what you're seeing is the experiment on the top row and the calculation for comparison, sharing the same absorption uh, color scale. So you can see that the experiment doesn't work as well, however, not optimized. This was literally his, uh, uh, he did a couple of attempts, you know, we could repeat the experiments and we we're very happy with that. So there's a lot more that I think we could do in terms of optimization, but that was not the goal, it was more advancement of, a, of the fundamental science here that is going on. But essentially in this case, what we had was an amorphous silicon uh, and then in the back, an aluminum copper a mixture. And so you can still see here the excitation, you know, of, of an optical mode in this particular case, if you go thicker, right, in the, in the amorphous silicon layer. You can see M1 and M2 now. So I think this is a really uh, nice uh, semi-quantitative agreement, I would say, at least a qualitative of how we could, you know, now be looking to these metals, uh, metallic mixtures more closely for superabsorption. Now, um, the, the last topic that I want to talk to you about, we're going to change gear here a little, is a, um, a different metal. And uh, what I've shown to you so far is that when you look at a uh, coin age metals, right, or even beyond coin age, uh, um, if you include aluminum to, to the game that is earth abundant and very, very low cost, there's quite a bit that you we can do at a thin film level and also at the nanoscale in terms of controlling the optical behavior. Now, a couple of years ago, literally in 2018, we, I, I was very interested in trying to um, focus on materials that are earth abundant. And even more so, but I was wondering, um, metals are great, except that we always leave a trace. If we can recycle, that's wonderful, right? We know that, uh, I don't know, maybe 94, 96% of the aluminum that we use is recyclable and we do recycle it, right? So it's essential that we do that. However, it would be really nice uh, uh, to be able to have a material, right? A, an optical type of device in which we don't have to worry about uh, picking up the material back. So let's think, for example, an application for the environment. Let's say we want to use some type of sensor to see how polluted an environment is. It would be really nice if in the crop fields, right, we don't have to go back and pick up all the sensors again. If something that can be transient, that can be um, biodegradable, uh, um, right, in a responsible manner, right, so that we can discard in a, in a responsible manner, that would be really good, especially now with all this energy crisis that we're living through. I think that would be really interesting. So we definitely want something that is earth abundant, right? And therefore low cost. And even more so at the point I was like, well, and then you know, what if we're in a situation where we want to think about a medical type of device that we want to implant in someone, um, do whatever reading we need to, and then not have to have that patient be submitted to a second medical procedure to remove the device. We want something that is biocompatible in that case, right? For sure. And then a third application, I always like encryption stuff. So I thought, 
What if we want to hide and reveal on information as we want? What if I have a secret, I have an information and I want to pass that to you, but if I'm in a situation where I don't want anybody else to find out the secret and I can, you know, just so let's say I'm in the middle of the way um, to, to meet you. And then uh, um, I am in a situation where I have a, this a photonic device, right? This information and I tell you, look, um, I really don't want anybody else to see this information. Uh, if I have to, I can even swallow this device and it's all biocompatible. So um, this is what triggered um, me to start looking at what I call transient photonics. So um, a system in which we can, again, uh, hold information of, of I meaning an optical behavior, right, in a stable manner and uh, have it uh, vanish as we want. Okay, so this is a representation of a, can we, um, in this particular case, produce colors from the RGB spectrum and uh, make these colors vanish as we wish, because then we can think about uh, encoding images, right, in an encryption way. So what we do is that we use magnesium for that. So let me tell the, 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 the secret here is magnesium. Um, magnesium is a, is a very interesting metal because it's the eighth most earth abundant element. Okay, it's extremely low cost, as I said, it is biocompatible and biodegradable. So it becomes a really interesting solution. In this particular case, what Tom did uh, when he was in his first year of grad school, PhD, was to demonstrate the color pixels that are biodegradable. So this would be really interesting, right? Uh, uh, again, if people want to replace their screen so often, right? Uh, what can we do? So in this particular case, the optical device that we have is a stack of what we call an MIM, a metal, an insulator, and a metal. And this MIM structure is made out of, uh, it's a sandwich. You have an MGO, magnesium oxide in the middle, also biocompatible, also uh, biodegradable, sandwiched by two layers of magnesium. So essentially what happens, we have a, a fabric resonance here, type of cavity. And uh, depending on the thickness of this MGO, we can actually tune light transmission. So if we make it uh, um, a smaller, this MGO thickness, we're going to have a blue shift. So that's what gives, as you can imagine here in B, what you see in this top row is a real color photographs of a, a 2.5 centimeters by 2.5 centimeters pieces of a glass, in this case, as the substrate with the, MG, the MIM structure on top. But by the way, I'm mentioning glass, but um, there are polymer that are biocompatible that worked very well with the system as well when we were working on that right now. But anyway, the point here being um, that what I was mentioning to you, as we increase the MGO layer thickness, we can red shift this peak in transmission. And then the, but that's essentially what we're seeing these real color photographs is that we have a white light source in the back. It's whatever light is being transmitted that gives color, right? Gives the hue to these uh, um, color pixels. And then uh, what we're seeing here in this uh, uh, um, CIE chromaticity diagram is that essentially we can be anywhere we want virtually by using this uh, MIM magnesium based uh, um, structure. So what we did was to first demonstrate that, uh, well, um, we can actually use those for encryption. So essentially what I'm showing to you now is a video where we basically put these color pixels in water. And what happens is that magnesium dissolves in water. One of the byproducts is uh, uh, magnesium hydroxide. NGO also dissolves in water to magnesium hydroxide as well. It produces some hydrogen, a very small amount of hydrogen. Um, turns out that uh, this uh, hydroxide is uh, earth abundant and it's uh, found in abundance in many, many countries. So that becomes really interesting. So what you're seeing here now is that within a 10 minutes, the colors, they finish completely. Okay, and as we speed up the, the, this video here, I can just move on to the, to the very last frame, I guess. That's fine. What you can see is that now it's just a white light what we're seeing. We're left with a glass substrate and that white, bright light. So just for comparison, you're seeing here the color pixels at the bottom in the beginning of the etching process with the water and the, the ultimate result. So um, as a snapshot, not sure why my videos are playing twice. Anyway, so um, as a, a snapshot here of what's going on, Again, we have a chemical reaction with the, between magnesium and water, as well as magnesium oxide and water. Magnesium hydroxide is produced in this case. And um, that's what we're seeing here, yeah, that uh, um, essentially we can uh, 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 make the colors disappear and vanish in a very short amount of time. We can do that faster if we increase temperature. Controlling the pH is also something that we can do that we're very interested. Uh, for example, could we have uh, what would happen right, if you use a pH of different environment you know, or urine? This is uh, it's something that it matters uh, for ultimate applications, depending on uh, which uh, field you're looking to for encryption in particular. 
So, um, and finally, what I want to share with you is uh, how does the color change as a function of uh, uh, the incidence of light in this particular case? So, what you're seeing here is transmission as a function of wavelength. The dots are experiments and the solid line is calculation. And these little squares are real color photographs, okay? We simply crop, okay, the, the, the photographs, but there is no uh, manipulation at all. So what you're seeing here at zero degrees, you read these graphs bottom top. It's normal incidence. So you can see that the blue maintained it is very strong a blue hue, up to 80 degrees. For the green sample, it changes a little to a petroleum type of blue. The Dijon one it changes to a greenish. But, you know, overall, I would say that up to almost 40 degrees, it's quite robust. And the colors, they're very vivid. And also keep in mind that, that uh, uh, I didn't mention that, but I probably should, that making yellow uh, is, is actually quite tricky um, unless you go to the nanoscale. So there are a lot, there's a lot of work, especially now in the last uh, few years, uh, playing with the chromaticity using metallic nanostructures. And uh, um, a lot of times uh, people can only achieve a pastel type of colors. So I think magnesium is a really interesting and trendy material for that. So I would like to conclude, I don't know for how long I spoke, I hope not too much, but I'd like to conclude with just saying that overall in summary, we are very interested in my group in looking at uh, different uh, metals and uh, um, looking at uh, controlling right, the optical properties. Can we control the electromagnetic spectrum having you know, several different applications in mind? So I, I mentioned solar cells, I did not show anything, but I mentioned, I mentioned superabsorption, I mentioned a, a catalysis and eventually photocatalysis. Right? Uh, we are also very interested in a fundamental uh, type material behavior and the material physics that takes place would be really interesting. There are a series of experiments we want to do next. For example, um, looking at uh, more closely the mixing entropy and the interdiffusion processes at the nanoscale by doing in situ transmission electron microscopy type of experiments. We love combining experiments with uh, uh, simulation and, and um, calculations in general. I think that's very beneficial for everybody that is working this project. So, um, and then second of all, I showed to you how magnesium, right, and uh, NGO is, a, is a really, a, 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 I think, a promising platform for, for transient photonics. Other type of example that I did not mention to you, uh, for example, if you want to use the, the MG, MGO, MG layer as a coating, right, for medical pills, you can imagine that then if there is an environment that is above a certain humidity level, that will change the co color of the pill and that will inform people, right, don't take these pills anymore they've been exposed to whatever level of humidity, you know, it's no longer uh, um, safe, right? So this reconfigurability, although um, irreversible, can be extremely useful in uh, several different scenarios. So um, this work that I've shown to you today is uh, the result of, uh, of uh, uh, the collective effort of a, a really talented group of students. I, I really enjoy mentoring the grad students and the postdocs. It's been a very rewarding. And also, I naturally have to thank the financial support of different funding agencies. Without their support, we would not be able to have done all this work. So with that, I would love to answer some questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Obrigado, professora. É muito interessante é, essa área de, de fotônica, além de metais novos. Eu acho que é uma área que está crescendo muito no, nos últimos anos. É, eu tenho uma pergunta, na verdade, foi feita durante o seminário do, do professor Mike. Ele pergunta como você faz para lidar com a oxidação é, da superfície nas medidas de é, epsilometria. Sim, uh, um, então, é, a oxidação é, é um problema de fato, a gente considera a oxidação, deixa eu ver aqui se eu tenho, ok. So, ouro não é problema, prata com certeza, várias coisas. Um, a gente fabrica as amostras e imediatamente, quando tira as amostras do sputtering, a gente um, mede por elipsometria, então a camada de oxidação vai ser razoavelmente fina, certo? Um, no caso de cobre, você praticamente tem cobre oxidado, certo? Alumínio e magnésio também, eu vou falar de alumínio e magnésio no minuto, mas deixa eu só dar um exemplo aqui, uh, uh, porque uh, um, essa questão é muito relevante. Então, o que eu estou mostrando aqui para vocês é exatamente o efeito de uma camada de óxido para cobre, certo? O que acontece é que esses metais, em particular, em geral, eles têm o que a gente chama de uma camada intrínseca de óxido, certo? Você vai... A temperatura ambiente, a gente basicamente tem uma camada de 2, 4 nanômetros do óxido e that's it. Você não vai continuar tendo difusão de oxigênio permanentemente. Isso não acontece. Uma vez que o óxido se forma, é uma, é uma barreira praticamente, certo? Então, tem um lado positivo e negativo. Então, aqui o que eu estou mostrando essencialmente é epsilon 1 e epsilon 2 
para duas situações, certo? Que foram modeladas, baseado na combinação de medidas de reflexão e transmissão por elipsometria. Então, verde é cobre uh, puro e, e em preto aqui a gente tem o cobre com uma camada de uh, 0.3 nanômetros nesse caso. A razão pela qual a gente usou 0.3 nanômetros aqui nesse caso é simplesmente porque foi aqui que nos deu o menor erro certo? Qualquer camada maior de cobre dava um erro maior para a gente, ok? Então, isso é uma das coisas, é que você pode, de fato, simular é, qual é a influência e quantificar qual é a influência dessa camada de óxido. O outro ponto que eu quero fa fazer aqui é que, no caso do, das nanoestruturas, se você tem uma camada de, de óxido, com certeza vai haver um shift, ok, na, na ressonância, e a gente pode quantificar quanto é isso também. No caso do alumínio e do magnésio, é sempre blue shift, quando a gente adiciona essa camada de óxido. E, e, inclusive, agora tem um estudante e um pós-doc que estão fazendo as contas com nanoestruturas de, mag, de magnésio e a gente consegue determinar exatamente quanto é. No caso de alumínio, de alumínio, alumínio é um material interessante, certo? Porque é, mesmo quando a gente está 10 a menos 10 tor em pressão, quer dizer, em ultra high vacuum, certo? Em 20 minutos você forma uma monocamada de alumínio oxide, de óxido de alumínio. Então, a gente tem que viver com isso, essencialmente. Mas, uh, uh, no fim do dia, eu acho que não é um, um problema tão grande para os, os sistemas que a gente tem, tem investigado. Certo. Tá bom. Obrigado, professora. Eu tenho a agradecer pela, pela sua disponibilidade em ministrar o webinar. É, claro. Muito obrigado. É, quaisquer pergunta a gente pode repassar para a senhora por e-mail. Claro, por favor. Uhum. E aí a gente Sim. mandar a resposta para o pessoal por e-mail. Então, a gente agradece mais uma é. vez. O... Meu e-mail está aqui. Tá certo. A gente pode deixar seu, o link do seu site disponível na, na descrição do vídeo? Certo. Meu site ainda é antigo, mas eventualmente eu vou dar um update. Mas pode mandar o e-mail da UC Davis, está ótimo. Tá, tá Sim, bom, pode então. deixar disponível. Tá certo. Tá. Deixa eu ver se tem mais alguma pergunta. Ah, tem mais uma pergunta aqui da Briane. É, que outros materiais estão sendo utilizados nas pesquisas de desenvolvimento da eletrônica transiente? Ah, então, é, é, tem, tem, tem muita coisa. Então, por exemplo, a, eu estou mais focalizada na parte de fotônica transiente. O pessoal que faz eletrônica transiente tem, decididamente, tem muita coisa. Magne, magnésio é um ótimo metal, não é ideal, mas considerando as propriedades de baixa compatibilidade, é, é, é muito, muito bom para você fazer contato elétrico também, é, silício, você pode dissolver silício em água, silício é areia, então sobre as condições adequadas vai dissolver, o quão rápido isso acontece é outra história, eu posso indicar um grupo pelo menos, é, é John Rogers, que estava na, na, em Urbana Champagne, na UIUC, mas agora ele é professor na Northwestern University, eles fazem muito trabalho com eletrônica transiente, especialmente para aplicação médica. Então, todos os substratos, certo, para suporte mecânico, nesse caso, claro que não seria vidro, isso aqui foi o exemplo mais simples que eu mostrei para vocês, mas uh, há polímeros que são compatíveis com, com o nosso sistema imunológico e, e, por exemplo, você quer colocar eletrodos, certo, e, e monitorar diferentes tipos de, de processos nas pessoas, então, isso é tipo de coisa que as pessoas fazem muito. So, então, em termos de materiais, eu diria que magnésio é um dos mais usados para conexão eletrônica ainda, é silício, decididamente. E sempre tem muita pesquisa em ouro, porque o pessoal diz que não é tóxico, né? Eu não sou especialista nisso, tem muito, muita pesquisa nisso, mas eu ainda não vi uma empresa realmente fornecer um produto nesse aspecto. Certo. E, e não seria transiente, desculpe, não seria transiente, no caso do ouro. E ela complementa a pergunta, é, questionando quanto tempo, mais ou menos, seria disponível um, um dispositivo fotônico... Com, baseado em metais é, no mercado. Ah, em quanto tempo? Isso, se, se tem algum, eu acho que a pergunta dela estava ah. se já tem alguma coisa no mercado pra, comercialmente possível com, com esse tipo de... Com, então, com, com a parte de fotônica, não que eu saiba, um, eu, eu nunca tinha visto ninguém a, a fazer color pixels a, que, que desaparecem, foi por isso que, que eu achei que essa seria uma das primeiras demonstrações que a gente devia dar. Eu achei que para muitas dessas a, a, TVs novas que chama wallpaper, né, papel de parede, que você até desenrola, 
Eu achei que isso seria uh, provavelmente útil, especialmente se os pixels eles têm cor uh, bem vívida, né? É, claro que você teria que usar uma camada para evitar uh, é, uma reação indesejada com água, certo? Então, tem muita coisa que a gente teria que fazer nesse sentido. É, é, com relação à eletrônica transiente, pode ser que já tenha alguns produtos decididamente em fase de teste com o paciente, mas não comercial. Mas a parte de fotônica eu ainda não vi nada comercial. Tá bom, então, acho que, que essas eram as perguntas. Se tiver mais alguma coisa, é, a gente lhe repassa por e-mail. A gente agradece mais uma vez Mas a é. sua disponibilidade. Muito obrigado. É, Muitíssimo obrigada pelo convite. Tá. Então, agora, se você quiser ficar ou quiser sair, você decide, a gente vai só anunciar o próximo webinar. A gente está fazendo agora de 15, em 15 dias. É, então, o próximo webinar, deixa eu só... Você pode só... É... Está, já parei, <risos> desculpa. Obrigado. É... O nosso próximo webinar é com o professor é... Marcelo. É... É, o professor Anderson está mandando uma mensagem para você, ele disse que gostou muito e agradeceu por você falar de pagar. Professora? Você me ouviu, né? Sim. Então, o próximo webinar do professor Marcelo, ele vai falar sobre vidros e, e sua relação com a, com a fotônica. Eu vou baixar e compartilhar aqui com vocês o... vendo a tela com o título do webinar. Ok, então, é, nosso próximo webinar vai ser com o professor Marcelo Nalim, do Instituto de Química da Unesp de Araraquara, e ele vai falar um pouco sobre vidro, manipular átomos e luz utilizando, utilizando vidros é, com meio material. Então, ele vai falar um pouco sobre o que ele chamou de a era do vidro, que, é, segundo ele, é o que estão chamando esse século que a gente está, e como o vidro te, tem revolucionado a vida de todos é, durante quase toda a humanidade, pelo menos no que, no que a gente conhece, certo? Então, ele vai falar sobre interação é, da luz com vidros e como é possível utilizar esse tipo de material para controlar e manipular a luz. É, então, dia 27 de agosto de 2020, às 15 horas, no mesmo horário. É, então, é, só mais um aviso, o, o link para os certificados estão na, na, na descrição do vídeo. É, e para o pessoal de materiais também, do, da, do Programa de Programação de Ciência de Materiais, o link está disponível e ficará até 20 minutos depois que a gente acabar aqui é, o webinar. Okay? Então era isso, muito obrigado pela participação de todos é, e boa tarde.